once you have more people um, in positions that can share these stories um, in the media, um, you know, you have then a more accurate representation of the stories that are actually out there in the community. Today on Dirty Linen, we are chatting to Sandra Tan. I'm very excited to have her on the show. Sandra is a member of the Entrepreneurs, a group of Australian Filipinas who create awareness and change and advocacy in and around Filipino food. Uh, Sandra is also a writer, editor and content strategist, mostly in the world of design and architecture. We bonded over an extraordinary meal at Chibog, a Filipino restaurant in West Footscray, and I'm glad to have the chance to connect again, Sandra. Though the topic we're going to dig into is an exhausting one, it is racism, and I really appreciate you uh, giving time and energy to this topic. Thanks for coming to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me over, Danny. So, Sandra, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, so I um, am a writer, um, a storyteller and a content strategist. I work primarily in a freelance capacity um, in the architecture and interior design media. Um, so I've been doing that for uh, probably about eight years now um, and really working across publications online um, and a little bit of social media, um, writing for a few magazines, um, and also helping uh, small to medium size uh, design businesses um, get their copy up to scratch. And how did you come to be part of the Entrepreneurs? So um, uh, I would say it's about the end of 2018. Um, I um, was approached by the co-founders, Fidesz, uh, Santos Argelias, and uh, Grace Ginto, um, to join this um, kind of crack team of uh, Filipino women who um, had realized that there was a bit of a gap in the market um, for promoting Filipino cuisine and also culture um, in Melbourne and broadly, um, you know, throughout Australia. Um, and it's basically a, a situation where everyone in the Filipino community kind of knows someone who knows someone else um, and they were looking as their uh, – events for Melbourne Food and Wine 2019 um, started to really gain traction and they realised, oh, this is this is a green light, it's going to happen. Um, they realised that they needed someone to be more um, uh, media-facing and help them approach uh, media and get coverage um, and things like that. So they looked across for a Filipino in the media and there's not heaps of us um, that are visibly Filipino um, out there. So um, that's how I came on board and I'm really glad that I did. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, I love um, what Entrepreneurs does and uh, anyone who hasn't already listened to my chat with Grace Ginto, it's episode 166, so scroll back and find that episode of Dirty Linen. She's fantastic and, yeah, I loved having her as part of the conversation here. Um, so I'm interested, you know, to let's get let's get into it. Let's talk about representation, perhaps in the media or what you've ex what you've witnessed in the food industry from your experience, Sandra. Um, yeah, and and also, I suppose backtracking a little bit, just how do you connect with your um, identity as an Australian Filipino woman? Yeah. Um, so, okay, maybe starting from from that point um, of heritage. Um, I was born here, so my family came over from the Philippines uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and so as a first-generation uh, Australian, I think that I probably accessed um, the Australian and, and Filipino parts of my identity at the same time, um, which I think is a lot, um, is a, quite a common experience for a lot of um, first-generation uh, Australians. Um, and... I think it took me a while to to realize that those two parts of myself um, were uh, equal to each other and in that I could um, be comfortable speaking to my culture in, in a workplace and in a professional setting. I think it took me a long time to work out that as a media professional, um, I didn't necessarily um, have to come in and, and put my, um, there's an idea of a customer service um, voice or, you know, a, a public facing voice. And then at home you speak in another way to your family. And that's quite a common experience too. Um, and it's, it's code switching. So basically making ourselves more palatable, um, perceived to be the norm um but in doing or you or you um cut yourself short 
may, may may not express it um, in in professional circles or things like you might not bring your mum's cooking to work to heat up in the work microwave because you feel like it's going to be a bit pungent when when it's heated up, um, you know. And it's all those types of conversations um, that that I now find um, in my professional life to be more and more. Um, um, people are more engaged with that type of conversation and more willing to have those um, discussions. So I think it's a time of change. Do you think that, you know, when you were, I guess, not expressing all parts of your personality in all arenas, do you feel like you were responding to signals that you were uh, seeing or feeling or hearing around you or was it a sort of self-censorship or, um, yeah? What- mm. It's all of those things. I think, um when you are a young person looking at the career that you want to um, or the industry that you're trying to um, gain success in and you don't see a lot of people there that look like you um, or it's you don't you don't know of anyone in your family or your family network um, doesn't work in that industry, particularly if you go into a creative field um, like the media or like um, the architecture world that I work in, um, I think it can be quite a daunting prospect to try and penetrate it if you don't have anyone else that's there extending um, a hand out to you or um, extending um, a little bit of solidarity to you. You don't feel comfortable because no one, you, you don't feel that anyone can relate to your circumstance. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a circumstantial thing where um, certain industries can seem to be only accessible by a privileged um, minority and then you yourself as a as a person going in there. Um, it does feel like you're treading new ground and you're a pioneer in some ways. Um, yeah. Mm, I think it's it's so it's representation is important in every arena, isn't it? And I guess, you know, I guess I've heard a lot of um, uh, migrants and first generation kids talk about, you know, their, their, their lunchbox, you know, they felt embarrassed to bring out whatever it is, the mortadella or, the, you know, the mm. garlicky, whatever, um, in the, in the schoolyard. And, you know, I hadn't, I guess, thought about it in terms of the office microwave, but it's like you, you know, you need to, yes, you not only need to see people that, um, perhaps look like you just to help smooth the path but you need to smell food that's, that you yeah. know, might be the same food that you want to eat um in in the in the work kitchen it's it's really interesting like representation is so important in so many different ways and there are, i guess there are so many signals that can make people feel welcome or otherwise um and yeah that's that's one of them totally totally yeah and i think yeah it's interesting because often if you look at um, you know, for me, the, the world of food is quite a new, um, a new landscape for me to be writing and telling stories in. And it's really only since I've been working with the entrepreneurs that that um, has become um, more a part of the work that I do. But um, for me, coming from the, you know, design and architecture world and writing and um, interviewing people in that space and just navigating that world, um, it almost, it did feel quite a lot um, different and more um, inclusive coming across to food because um, suddenly now it's everyone's heritage is being celebrated. Everyone's, um, you know, the food of your homeland is such a strong narrative that people want to um, understand and there's so much more curiosity about it now. Um, whereas in the design world, it's not really a conversation that we're having. It's only now that we're starting to understand what um, unpacking prejudice and, and privilege looks like in that space and it's not a comfortable um it's not a comfortable uh chat to to be a part of even for um you know someone who's a part of a minority that 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 um that furthering that conversation would would help so yeah um it's interesting it's very interesting but i i do enjoy kind of looking looking across at both realms and and seeing the differences there yeah, um, I, I don't know. I've got so many questions sparking in my mind by the, by what you're saying. Uh, you know, I, I'm wondering, is it that everybody engages with food in some way? Is it that food in some ways is more portable and people can sort of dip in and out of it? Is it that people don't have language to speak about design people aren't as design literate or perhaps is that just me? Um, is it that design and architecture is somehow seen as a more neutral and 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 that it doesn't that it doesn't I don't know have such a 
a cultural voice in some way, although even as I say that, I think, you know, <laughs> that's really easy to shoot down. Um, but, yeah, that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting, I guess, to consider why there are these differences in different arenas in the kinds of conversations that are going on. Mm. I think um, for me, there's something about, you know, naturally being around a table, sharing food with people. Um, there's an element of that that will um, organically help to break down um, the the cultural barriers or it should. Like, you know, the, the very act of sharing a meal with someone is is hospitality. It's welcoming. It's, it's providing a um, inviting space where an exchange can occur. Um, whereas I think there's still a perception in the design and architecture community that um, that's it's the it's a it's a privileged intellectual space, um, and so within that there are still um, these perceived gatekeepers of that because it's such a um, you know it's such a studied um, pursuit um, that that I feel like the the traditional um, institutions that kind of get keep um you know what we th- consider to be good or, or um worthy design are still quite traditional so i think maybe change is just not as rapid because because we don't have to interact with design three times a day but we have to eat three times a day um you know so it's not it's just not as an immediate conversation it's not at the forefront of the the general public's minds but i do try and um with the work that i do try to help change that and make the language around it more accessible you know i always have to think um and and this is where i guess um a migrant background has served me uh i think really positively is that um one of the ways that i think i i bring effective communication to the work that i do is i always have to think how am i going to explain this to my family (laughs) <laughs> like how am I going to explain this like really highly conceptual building um, or these really kind of lofty, um, you know, design ideals and principles? How would I have ha- have a discussion about this with my family that, you know, come from outside of this world? Um, and, you know, and language in my case is not a barrier because Filipinos, um, for the most part, we all speak English quite well. Um, it's it's not the language, it's the cultural, the, the culture and the um the kind of discourse around it can seem really impenetrable to people outside of it. Um, so, yeah, whereas food is something that, you know, we all need to eat. So, Yeah, I, bet, I mean, we all live in buildings and we all, you know, pick up objects that are designed, you know, a million times a day. There's something, yeah, so, I mean, the opportunities to engage with design with all kinds of lenses are always there but I think you're right it's like there is this idea that it's somehow elevated and not for everybody to speak about or that not everyone can have meaningful conversations about it so I mean what kinds of things do you do in your work that do try to break some of these notions down? Um, I find um, the it's taken a while for me within my career to be comfortable um, instigating a lot of these conversations. But I think what's really helped, there's a, um, wherever I can, um, I try to, um, you know, advocate for different voices to come out and try and tell different stories that we might not usually hear from. And also it's about um, de, um, de centra, no, hang on, I'm going to like um, stuff up this word, de, decentralizing, um, uh, this kind of um, Eurocentric or, or um, white design narrative. Um, so I did a talk um, a while ago uh, alongside a publication called Design Anthology, who the, the editor of it um, actually uh, moderated that talk. Um, but it was all about, you know, the value of um, being proudly uh, Asian designed and, and manufactured because there's still this kind of stigma um, of, you know, oh, if you have your products made in, um, in, in Asia, it means they're not as great quality, um, you know, or you're contributing to sweatshop conditions. When in reality, you know, a lot of the design cultures around the world, like if you're talking about, say, something like rattan, um, which is, you know, native to Indonesia and parts of Southeast Asia, um, that's a, a heritage of making that's, you know, lasted like centuries, generations, and these families have been making and, and, and honing those skills for, 
you know, just easily as long as any, you know, European manufacturer that we all really highly revere. So, yeah, I think it's about um, bringing new voices to the fore, um, hearing from people that we haven't before and, and championing diversity in a way that's not tokenistic. I can really see parallels with what you're saying and, for example, you know, the conversation that's around, you know, why can't you charge as much for um, for dumplings as you can for pasta? Like why why are, um, yeah, why, yeah, why is a bowl of Asian dumplings not elevated in the same way that a bowl of tortellini might be? I think there's something really similar in that and I think it's 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 not i mean i i i agree with what you what you said before about food you know being this sort of congenial sharing uh arena where you can gather and find connection but i think it can it just the fact that you're doing that and the fact that you're enjoying food of it from a culture that's not your own, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've sort of gone all the way in, in decolonizing some of those assumptions about where it sits in, you know, a, a gastronomic canon. Um, it's, and yeah, I, I think, yeah, so I, it, it, it really, it really resonates what you're saying. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, and I think, um, that's why, um, because for the most part, I guess for my career, it's only really been the last couple of years that I've sat on this um, concept um, of heritage and, and thought about how it actually does apply to my professional life um, in ways that I can help um, open the door for other people now that I've got, you know, whatever platforms that I do have access to. Um, so, and that's the other part of the story is that once you have more people um, in positions that can share these stories um, in the media, um, you know, you have then a more accurate representation of the stories that are actually out there in the community um, because it's not, um, I don't know, I wouldn't put it to anyone that um, that didn't have that same shared experience to, to have that on their radar of what, what, um, what stories need to be told. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's, it, yes, I mean, I suppose looking at the entrepreneurs from my perspective, it feels like, there's this dual project, which is instilling a, you know, a real sense of pride in people who are already experts in Filipino food to say, you know, this is of enormous value and everybody should know about it. It's, you know, there is so much good, juicy, tasty, uh, culturally rich stuff that, that we can share with, um, everybody but then it's also that outreach project where it's like you know i know for myself um i i feel very ignorant about filipino food but i've learned a little bit more through through your work and it's really opened my mind and, and i guess also opened my mind to all the things that i am yet to learn um i mean i know that there's you know many layers and thousands of islands and all these different strands to this really rich cuisine so it's yeah, it's it's very it's very mind opening, and I suppose let's let someone like myself know that I'm just at the start of of that learning journey. Yeah, totally. And I think we all are. Like, importantly, um, you know, just being a person of color doesn't necessarily mean that we're we're the experts in any of this either. I think, you know, my own example, especially, I've um, I've just been learning and learning, and that's really been the hugest part of. Um, you know, the, the the real joy of being involved with a group like the Entrepreneurs is that I learn from them what it, the very many various ways that there are to be Filipino that I wasn't really um, aware of before. You know, each of us, um, I guess each of us all represent, we have different um, languages based on the different regions of the Philippines that our families come from. We don't even all speak necessarily the same home language. Um, and even within um, the languages that we do share, there's regional um, differences. So um, there's so much complexity. And I think it's only by having these conversations that um, we are able to discover that, um, you know, even even for people that, that do come from different um, different parts of the world. Like for a lot of people, um, I'm, I happen to be a vegetarian, although um, 
as you you would have seen um, at that uh, lovely dinner that we were both at, I can definitely be tempted by seafood. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm a vegetarian and I eat Filipino food all the time. And a lot of um, people uh, that are Filipino don't even really think that that's possible. Um, it's like it's like mutually exclusive events. Like, well, you can't be Filipino and be a vegetarian because. Our, our cuisine is so meat based, but actually it's possible. And we do have a lot of, uh, you know, cuisine that from since the dawn of time has always been um, vegetarian and even vegan. So it's a it's a learning, it's an exchange and a learning that goes both ways. And I think it's been a really um, just such a joy to be a part of it. Mm. To, um, Sandra, I'd love just, you know, your expertise as a as a writer and content strategist. I'd love to know what you've been able to bring to or what you've noticed in the world of, of communication around food, whether it's the way people speak about food or the way that food media operates um, or even, I don't know, the way that menus are written, you know, what sort of, you know, with your content strategist hat on, what have you noticed um, in the world of, of food communication? Yeah, um, I think it's such a... It's such a rich um, industry, and it's it's very I find heavily um, visual. So it's it's become more important than ever, I think, to have great photographers on on your side, um, because you know uh, so much of my work, even though you know writing is my thing, and and I'm a huge word nerd, and I'll, I I love to to write and be able to distill ideas um, in words, but. There's only so much you can do as a writer um, where a picture really can say a thousand words. So um, I find that strong photography can can really do so much to communicating the essence of um, a dish, um, you know, a chef's work, um, you know, a, a, a way of eating. Um, that it's so it's so strong. So I think um, creating content in this space it needs to be both visual and and storytelling and also. Um, passing the mic where you can um, to to the people that inspire the cooking. Um, so, you know, I think we've we've seen um, in the industry lately that um, we're examining who um, in in both travel and and food, we're examining who who gets to do the traveling and who gets to do the eating and through what lens we're looking at all of these um, stories. And I think more and more, like there's that. Um, series on Netflix, the um, street food um, series that I think did that really well, where it's like they've actually um, put front and centre the people that have been doing this for generations, um, you know, in their, in their kitchens, in some in the back alley, um, and there's nothing glamorous or, or fancy about it. But um, it's just, it's giving credit where it's due um, and, and really putting the audience there in front of them. And I think that's really powerful. Mm, it's... Yeah, it's really interesting. This it, it makes me think of this idea of discovery and the problems that are that can be bound up in that notion. That you know, if I think about myself traveling, it's like I always want to you know eat eat the local specialties or you know find the local ingredients. Um, but I think yeah, I, I think there is also something problematic in that where it's yeah this stuff it's not really there to be discovered it's just what people are growing and eating and um yeah it's I suppose it's like is my lens the right lens to put over this food it's um yeah definitely something that I'm considering more and more at the same time as I still want to travel, not that I can, but <laughs> I'm still keen to travel and eat and engage with people that are, um, yeah, that are cooking and eating. In, yeah. Well, I mean, we can through food, right? I mean, that's the way we travel now. <laughs> I guess. Um, but, you know, there's real power in, I think, in, in what you do with, um, you know, the podcast and the work that you do in, um, I think you do, you're one of the people that I would point to that does pass the mic um, where it's possible, like the fact that we're having this conversation and you've been um, so proactive in, in trying to um, reach out and understand the, the provenance of food and, and food heritage, um, I think is really great. Um, so it's it's um, the last thing that we would want to do is gatekeep and say that only these people can tell these stories because, um, like, as I said, I'm probably not um, the expert on Filipino food just because I'm by virtue of being Filipino. Um, it's just really about um, adding more to the mix. 
Um, yeah, but- I, I suppose it's, I mean, <laughs> thanks for saying that. I wasn't, I wasn't fishing, but um, I guess it's just something that, you know, I'm really considering as much as I can. And I suppose, you know, my answer in all of these things is to be open and, and to try to be respectful. And I guess, you know, no one, no one starts as an expert in anything and it's, you know, we're all, it's all a learning journey. Um, and I suppose it's just, yeah, about going into things with, with, uh, with, in, in with intention and not trying to, I guess, simplify or have a preconceived idea about, you know, what the story is or, um, who the right person is to tell it. But yeah. 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 It's, it's always a curiosity. I think if you can um, be really open and transparent about the fact that it's you're you're curious, you're on this journey of trying to learn, um, and you really want to be shown, I think that really comes across. Mm. Yes, it, I've got an image in my mind of of Grace drinking a shot of I think it was rum out of a out of bone marrow, and I feel like well, I definitely went into that situation with curiosity and interest. <laughs> Yeah, so did I because I'd never actually seen that happen before. <laughs> and I think I would have been, had I not been vegetarian, I would have been right there with her, like taking a shot out of the other end of that bone marrow. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know if we, if I've explained it enough, for, but for the listeners, so basically we had this amazing dish of, of bone marrow. Um, and sorry to dig into it for you, the vegetarian, Sandra, but just to explain. So it was beautiful bone marrow. We scraped it out. It was, I guess it was roasted. It was really caramelized and this beautiful jellied mass. Um, and then it was scraped into some incredible rice. Uh, it was very jeweled and delicious. But then the bone marrow became a vessel that you could pour a shot into and use as a funnel slash cup. And um, yeah, it was super fun and theatrical. <laughs> and um, yeah. I, and very, very dramatic. Yeah. For what was that a Monday night? Yeah, it was. It was big. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. For anyone Filipino listening, it was a bulalot fried rice. So it's like a beef dish that um, I don't know whether it was John Rivera or Ross Magnaya that um, was behind that particular dish, but um, it's a beef stew um, that yeah they used a big um, beef bone in, and it was yeah by all accounts delicious. I did say that if they produced a celery um stick i would do the same thing love it out of that yeah i can see you doing that um sandra is there anything else that you would like to say as part of this conversation um uh i don't know on the on the front of um racism and prejudice um one real quick anecdote that i have to share is that i um recently was part of a talk i was invited to host a discussion um on the future of um the the female future of design um, and what that meant to the various panelists. And we had a pre-discussion um, before we had the taped um, public recording um, where one of the panelists raised her hand and said, well, don't you think it's a bit of a problem that everyone on this panel is white? <laughs> and up until then, even I hadn't really clocked it. Um, and, you know, and then she said, you know, I, I'd, I'd be much more comfortable if um, if Sandra wasn't just the host and, and um, conduit to this conversation, but if she could also be a part of the conversation on an equal footing to us. And, um, and it kind of blew me away because it was the first time in my career that that had ever happened where someone had passed the mic to me and kind of... Um, you know, went through like went through this awkward um, conversation and, and sort of persevered and said, no, I think this is not right. Maybe we need to change it. Are we open to changing it? And it was just such a powerful moment and it's left me thinking that if I could do that for someone else, um, you know, how, how good would that be if we could all do that for someone else? Um, you know, maybe we could hit this, um, this thing on the head um, presentation-wise. Uh, that's so powerful because you just know, like, no one who was in that room will ever be able to look at a panel without that lens now. And yeah, like that is change, like in action. That's so exciting. I love totally. it. Yeah, I nearly cried. It was. Really I'm nearly powerful. crying now. It's so <laughs> powerful. I just absolutely love it. I mean, yeah. no one listening to this would ever be able to look at a panel and not think, you know, is this panel representative? Who is not? Who does not have a voice here? I think that's so good. Um, yeah, 
Absolutely love it. That's really powerful. Um, Sandra, thank you so much for coming along to have a chat today to us at Dirty Linen. Um, I'm really thrilled to have you as part of this. It's a difficult topic, but it's an important one and I'm grateful to you for um, throwing some time and energy at it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production.